Well, good morning, church. We are, as a church, studying through 2 Corinthians, and I want to invite you to turn there with me, if you would. We're going to consider the entire second chapter of, 1 Corinthians, of 2 Corinthians in one setting uh, for a reason, as I think you'll see in a minute. So we'll be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. And if you have found your way there, would you join me as we stand together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says this, verse 1, But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? This is the very thing I wrote to you, so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote you with many tears, not so that you would have been made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment, is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him, for to this end also I wrote so that I might put to test, put you to test, whether you are obedient in all things. But one whom you forgave anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, an aroma from death to death, to another, an aroma from life, to life, and who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Any questions? Let's dig in, but before we talk about them, let's talk to them. Again, our God and our Father, we would ask for a special measure of your spirit to understand such an important text. We pray, Lord, that you would turn on the lights that we might see clearly. We pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts to believe. May our hearts be like the parable of Jesus, the sower and the seed, a heart that has been plowed and made soft, Stones removed, thorns, thistles removed, that the seed, that is the word of God, might take root and bear fruit in us all. Father, we are a sinful people. The one who preaches his sins are many. We pray that you would purge us and cleanse us and wash us anew and afresh, that we might come before you and your word with clean hands and a clean heart that we might be beneficiaries of the fullness of this truth. Uh, we ask, God, that you would not just allow us to be challenged this morning, but more importantly, changed, not just confronted by the word of God, but conformed to the image of Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I've titled this message, A Fragrance of Christ. A fragrance of Christ. That exact phrase appears at the beginning of verse 15 in our text. 
Verse 15, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And this is an amazingly powerful truth as we shall see in a minute. I titled this message, A Fragrance of Christ, although I thought about titling this message, The Trivial and the Transcendent, or Missing the Transcendent because of the trivial. And the reason I want us to consider this entire chapter in one message is that simple truth about all of us. Our fallen tendency to get all hung up, fixated, concerned, preoccupied, and focused on the trivial. What did you wake up thinking about this morning? The transcendent or the trivial? As I preach right now, what are you thinking about? The transcendent or the trivial? Did I turn the lights off in the car? Did I lock the door? Did I turn the stove off? How do I look? Did I wear the right shoes? Do they match my purse? Okay. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Hung up, fixated, concerned, preoccupied, focused on the trivial, <clears throat> while essentially being unaffected, not concerned, untouched by the transcendent. In this single chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul begins by addressing the trivial. That is, the trivial concerns of the Corinthians. You'll remember the Corinthians sensed that Paul had wronged them. There are issues, as we have seen, concerning things like travel plans, what he's written, what he hasn't written, when he's come, when he hasn't come, hurt feelings, a bad apple in the church, the minority versus the majority in the church. I could go on. And then, before we reach the end of this chapter, Paul will turn his attention to the transcendent. What do I mean by that? You'll just have to wait for a minute. So as I prepared this message this week, I was aware that I faced an issue. I only have so much time on Sunday mornings. How much time do I spend on the trivial as opposed to the transcendent? In terms of what is ultimately important, let's face it, the trivial is frankly the trivial at least in comparison to the transcendent. The transcendent is the transcendent. But as I thought about the trivial versus the transcendent, I was struck by the Apostle Paul's wisdom. Paul, who is both a pastor and at the same time a very unique theologian and apostle, applies great wisdom in this chapter. As a pastor, Paul will deal with the trivial first. But as a theologian, Paul will deal with the transcendent secondly, but he will do so extensively. When I say trivial, what I mean by that is people issues. When I say transcendent, what I mean by that is God issues. Are people issues really trivial? Yes and no. No, because God cares about people. God cares about those who are his own. God cares about the spiritual, physical, emotional well-being of his people. And because God cares, therefore Paul will care and give them first place, trivial people issues. However, the truth is also this, and I'm trying to learn this myself, is that people issues ought to be greatly affected by God issues. In many ways, people issues... Even the people issues that Paul's dealing with, in many cases, wouldn't even exist if the God issues had the right kind of effect. If we, as the people of God, were so dynamically affected by the transcendent truths of God issues, many of our people issues would dissipate. When it comes to people issues, again, often it's so easy for us all to become caught up with the here and now, with our personal situations, with people and personalities, just the drama of living that we lose reference to the God issues, so caught up in the relative trivial that we forget easily the transcendent. Let me unbreak, unravel, and exegete this text. 
We will follow Paul's order, so first we will deal with people issues. Paul and the Corinthian church issues. In verses 1 through 11 of this chapter, Paul continues to deal with people issues, the trivial. That is to say, his complicated relationship with the Corinthian church. And again, as we look at this text, everything that we have seen both in our study of 1 Corinthians in the last several weeks as we began our study in 2 Corinthians, everything from his original visit, what's called theology, the previous letter, 1 Corinthians, the emergency visit, the severe letter, all part of the equation. And specifically in this passage that we have before us, Paul is dealing with two general people issues. And they are these. One, Paul still in the Corinthian sense of having been wronged by him. And two, the Corinthians, Paul, and a specific troublemaker in the church. So Paul and the Corinthians, they sense he's wronged them. And on the other hand, we have Paul, the church, and a specific person in the church who's causing trouble. Two issues. First issue, Paul and the Corinthians. Notice verse 1 through 4 with me again. But I determined this for your sake, your own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? This is the very thing I wrote to you, so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence you in you all that my joy would be a joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. What is going on here? Well, first of all, if you'll notice verse 1, notice it carefully, it begins with the conjunction in my Bible, the NASB, New American Standard, the word but. Verse 2 begins with the conjunction, NASB says for. The but in verse 1 and the for in verse 2 are actually the same Greek word. It is the Greek, New Testament Greek conjunction gar, rendered but in verse 1, for in verse 2. And the reason I'm saying this to you is it's important because this conjunction, both in verse 1 and verse 2, is telling us that Paul is resuming what he was addressing in chapter 1. And hopefully you'll remember from last week, it was just seven days ago, that in chapter 1, Paul is, that, that Paul is uh, pointing out two things, or that we see two things. Uh, remember this, that in chapter 1, the Corinthians had begun keeping a ledger on Paul. Do you remember that? Say amen. Keeping track of all Paul's wrongs. They sensed he had wronged them, and all of a sudden, everything he was, everything he was and everything he did, didn't do, wrote, didn't write, came, didn't come, wouldn't take, everything was a blot against Paul. But we also saw a second point last week. And that was the positive exhortation to us all, and that was Paul's pursuit of reconciliation with the Corinthians. So let me break this down. The issue at hand in verses 1 through 4 is the Corinthians feel wronged by Paul. They feel wrong because he didn't fulfill his promise to return to them. But you'll remember, rather, he returned back to Ephesus heart filled with sorrow, and instead of returning to them, he wrote them a letter which is called the severe letter. We don't have it. It's not in the New Testament. And essentially in verses 1 through 4, Paul says this, On one hand, I didn't want to come to you because of sorrow. If I would have come to you, it would have caused me more sorrow. It would have caused you more sorrow. If I would have come to you, it would have further eroded our already complicated relationship. So, I didn't come. But on the other hand, Paul says, I didn't come to you, not only because I didn't want to exacerbate sorrow, but I didn't come to you because of my love for you. Instead of coming to you, causing more sorrow, I wrote you a letter. Yes, it was severe, but I wrote the severe letter because of my love for you. Notice verse 1, notice it. But I determined this for my own sake, 
that I would not come to you again in sorrow and thereby express and exaggerate infectious sorrow among you all. Notice the end of verse 4 as well. But rather I wrote you that you might know the love which I have especially for you. Let me give you a, a practical idea that I have suggested many times as a pastor in counseling and in other contexts. Why would Paul write a letter instead of coming? Uh, allow me to suggest when it is important for you and I to communicate something in, let's say, a toxic setting. Instead of speaking, try writing. Because that's exactly what Paul in the Spirit determined to do. Why would that be? Well, let me suggest some reasons. Writing allows you to think clearly through, you want to, through what you want to say. Writing allows you to edit what you want to say. No slips. Writing allows you to thoughtfully choose words, the idea of articulation. Writing allows you to avoid miscommunication, allows you to complete a thought without interruption, allows you to avoid running down rabbit trails and knee jerking. Also, reading. Reading allows for time, doesn't it? Time to digest what's being said. Another great thing about reading is that you can read it and reread it and read it again and again. Reading removes that person-to-person -person reaction, temper, flair, right? And most importantly, reading allows the recipient time to pray, to meditate, to comprehend what's being said. Paul chose to write them instead of a face-to-face -face visit in order not to exacerbate the sorrow, but rather to express his love, the severe letter. So again, here is people issues. Two general issues, Paul and the Corinthians, we just looked at verse 1 through 4. The second issue is the Corinthians and a specific troublemaker. Look at verses 5 through 11. And I will try to emphasize this person with my voice as we read through five, uh, verse 5 through 11. Here it is. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to you all. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. So that on the contrary, excuse me, sufficient was such a one in this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. Verse 7, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him, for to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things, but one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Two issues, people issues. Corinthians still sense Paul has wronged them. Paul says, I haven't wronged you. I didn't come because I didn't want to exacerbate sorrow. I wanted to express love. The second issue is here we have this person in the Corinthian church. One commentator calls this section a triangular relationship. That is a three-sided relationship. You've got Paul, you've got this person, this man, and you have the Corinthian church. And apparently when Paul made his emergency visit to Corinth, returning now to Ephesus, Paul was so sorrowed by this individual that he determined that he could not return, but rather wrote them. Again, a certain man is at the forefront of this sorrow, a troublemaker. Who is he? We don't know. 
What did he do? We don't know. As is consistent with Paul's pastoral demeanor, personality, and practice, he doesn't name the man, nor does he point out the sin. Many commentators have speculated that this man is the insensuous man in 1 Corinthians 5. We don't know. There's no evidence of that. But the one thing that is clear is that this man uniquely attacked Paul. Another thing that is clear is that when Paul wrote the severe letter, again, instead of going to them, he specifically addresses this man. In fact, you can look there or just listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12. He says this, So also I wrote you, it was not for the sake of the offender, that is the man, nor for the sake of the one defended, that's me, Paul, but for your earnestness on, behalf of, on our behalf uh, might be made known to you in the sight of God. And what he's saying there, and you can't miss this, is the thing that most sorrowed Paul wasn't the man, but the church. The church's indifference to this man. The church's inaction about this man. Again, verse 5, look at it carefully. If any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow, not to me per se, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, here again, pastoral finesque, to you all. And the idea is this, this man has divided the church. Some, a minority in the church, supported him, supported his actions, supported his lies about Paul. But the majority did not support him, rejected him. But as a result of inaction, the church was divided. The church had become paralyzed to take action against this individual. And as a result, the church didn't defend Paul. And as a result, the entire church is compromised and sorrowed. And when Paul wrote the severe letter, he called the entire church to unite and pursue church discipline on this man. And guess what? They did. And guess what? Church discipline worked. And guess what? This man repented. Can everybody say amen? The church is restored. Now, as you look at these verses that we read, let me point out what's taking place. Now, in light of the church's obedience, the church's church discipline on this bad apple, the man's repentance, in verses 6 or 11, Paul is calling the Corinthian church, here it is, to end church discipline, to restore this man in love, to be careful not to cause this man so much sorrow that he abandons the faith, and then to reunite as a church. Having said all that, these verses are going to make a whole lot more sense. Look at verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. Verse 7, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Verse 8, wherefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Verse 9, for to this end, that is this man's repentance and restoration, for to this end I also wrote so that I might put you, the, put you to the test. That is, would you as the Corinthian church do what is right or won't you? I put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Verse 10, but the one whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. Verse 11, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Paul is calling the church to end the discipline, restore this man in love, be careful about his spiritual moorings, make sure he doesn't apostatize, and then unite as a church. Why? Because we know Satan's schemes. We know about compromise. We know about division. We know about sin going unchecked in the church. We know about all these dangers, and we also know about the dangers of not being a church characterized by love and healing and unity and forgiveness and righteousness, right? We know these things. So that's what Paul is doing. Paul is dealing with people issues. So again, let me just take a minute. Um, these are important principles for all of us, for our elders, for you, reconciliation, church discipline, being united. And I began by calling these kinds of issues trivial. 
Is reconciling a relationship trivial? No. Is the restoration of Paul and the Corinthian church and their relationship trivial? No. Is church discipline trivial? No. It's one of the most painful things that you can go through. Is human sorrow, your sorrow, someone else's sorrow trivial? No. Are ultimately people issues trivial? No. However, in comparison to what Paul is about to articulate, they are all trivial. In comparison to the transcendent truth that Paul is about to begin un unraveling, revealing, in comparison to the God issues, all of our people issues are, relatively speaking, trivial. What do I mean? Beginning in verse 14, mark it, mark it. Beginning in verse 14, having dealt with people issues, Paul begins what is really the centerpiece of the entire book of 2 Corinthians. Beginning in verse 14, Paul begins a section that will run all the way through 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. Uh, verse 4. Beginning in verse 14, Paul begins essentially a six-chapter section comprised of 83 verses in which Paul identifies himself uniquely as the apostle, as the messenger, as the herald of the newly arrived, newly inaugurated, here it is, new covenant. Beginning in verse 14, the centerpiece of the entire book, beginning in verse 14, all the way through chapter 7, beginning in verse 14, six chapters, 83 verses, in which Paul identifies himself uniquely as the apostle, the messenger, the herald of the newly arrived and newly inaugurated new covenant. Paul's ministry as an apostle is this, the new covenant has come. To quote Barrett in his masterful commentary on 2 Corinthians, he says this, Paul is, quote, claiming nothing less than to be the mouthpiece and yoke fellow of God, heralding the long-awaited and newly arrived new covenant. Paul's message, Paul's ministry declares that history is now changed. History has been divided between the no longer and the now. Paul's ministry, that which was formerly dark, has now come to full light. Paul's ministry, the moment has arrived in which God's promised eschatological purpose has been realized. The entire history of God's dealings with humanity has transcendently changed. That's transcendent. This transcendent, promised, new covenant is fulfilled. Which clearly makes things like travel plans, hurt feelings, human ledgers, bad apples on a comparison relatively trivial. According to a man named W.H. Bates in his masterful work, commentary, The Integrity of Second Corinthians, Bates writes what Paul says, writes in 2 Corinthians 2.14 through chapter 7, listen, is, quote, the most intricate and profound exposition of Paul's apostolic ministry to be found anywhere in his letters. That's where we are, or that's where we're beginning to be. Paul is saying that I have been called by God, I am led by God, I am enslaved to God to announce and to articulate that promised new covenant has come. Let me pause for a minute. Uh, I grew up, got saved when I was 20 or so, plugged into a church, doesn't matter what kind, heard the gospel and all of that. It wasn't until 
decades later that I came to understand the New Covenant. So many professing Christians can go to church for a lifetime and never hear, never understand, never be taught about this amazing transcendent work of God called the New Covenant. It's amazing. And you and I are beneficiaries of it, even though you may not be aware of it. Can I ask you to stick a marker in 2 Corinthians 2? We'll get right back there. What is the new covenant? What does it consist of? A couple places. Look with me, if you would, in the Old Testament to Jeremiah chapter 31. And I want you to make some mental notes as we look at these promises concerning what does the new covenant consist of? What is it? What is it that God has promised to do? Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 31. Here it is. God says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. Whenever you see declares the Lord, that is emphatic. You get that? That's not God says, that is declaration. Days are coming. Listen to this. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day in which I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, that's the Exodus and Moses, that covenant, my covenant, they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Rather, verse 33, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Listen to this. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. What is the new covenant? A promised day in which God will deal with sin in such a way that the spiritual blinding um, manifestation of sin in all of us will be done away with to the point that we are able to know God. On the other hand, the New Covenant also promises that God in the New Covenant will reveal himself in such a way so profoundly that the human heart with this riddance and forgiveness of sin is able to embrace the true knowledge of God in a life-transforming way. What's the New Covenant? The New Covenant is a divine enabling of God involving the forgiveness of sins the opening of blind eyes, the softening of the heart, a revelation of who God is so profound and so dramatic that it is life-changing. Israel, before the New Covenant, the entire Old Testament, God forgives, they sin. God forgives, they sin. God forgives, they sin. An entire Old Testament. God's going to change all that in the New Covenant. Listen to Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, the heart of your offspring, and so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live in the new covenant. Deuteronomy 30. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. It's not just a command. It will also be a gift. This is grace. God will do in us in the new covenant that which we could never do for ourselves. Enable us to truly love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our might, so that we may live. Wow. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. 
Ezekiel 36, the new covenant. Beginning at verse 26, Ezekiel 36, 26. Moreover, God says, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit. Notice the emphasis of the spirit in all of this. And I will put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit, the Holy Spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statues. Listen, and a new uh, enabling to obey God's word. I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances and you will live in the land that I gave your forefathers so you will be my people and I will be your God. The new covenant. You can make your way back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, you know, I, I hope you see this as Transcendent. Listen, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he inaugurated the Lord's Supper, Jesus announced to his disciples, shockingly, what? That the new covenant had arrived. Luke twenty two twenty, and in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup, listen to this, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. What is the new covenant? The new covenant is Christ coming and revealing God in a way that God had never been revealed before. The new covenant is the death, burial, forgiveness of sins, complete and utter righteousness, forgiveness through Christ's saving work, the resurrection, life, the coming of the Spirit, enablement, empowerment, never known prior to the coming of the new covenant. And Paul is saying in our text, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, just as Jesus announced the coming and arrival of the new covenant on the night in which he has been betrayed, here I am and I am called by God to announce the arrival of the new covenant, listen, to the world. As Jesus announced in the upper room, now God has placed me on the stage of human history to announce the arrival of the new covenant to the world, to the Gentile world, yes, including you who are in Corinth. In the book of Hebrews, what is the writer's concern? The new covenant. Hebrews 7.22, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Hebrews 8, 6, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant with better promises. Hebrews 9, 15, for this reason, he, Jesus, is the mediator of the new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promises of an eternal inheritance. Hebrews 12, 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Of, of Abel. The new covenant. The new covenant, the new covenant, the new covenant. We are new covenant people, and Paul was the ambassador of this new covenant. As John the Baptist was to the coming of Christ, so Paul is to the coming of the new covenant. He is the forerunner and the herald of the new covenant. By the way, in this extended section, look with me, in light of everything we've just looked at in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Deuteronomy, look what Paul says to these Corinthians, and we'll get right back to chapter 2, I promise. But notice what he says to them. What he says to them is that they themselves, the Corinthians back then in the first century, are experiencing the realities of the fulfillment of the new covenant. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 for a minute. Look at it. Verse 2, you are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifest that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on tables of what? Human hearts. That's the new covenant. Look at verse 5, chapter 3. 
Not that we ourselves are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is of God. I'm just a spokesman of the new covenant. I'm just a herald, and now I don't have any. I didn't create the new covenant. This has come from God. Verse 6 Who, God, also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant? Not of the letter of the law, for the letter kills, but of the Spirit, which gives life. But if the ministry of death and the letters engraved on stones, that's the Ten Commandments, the Old Covenant. Why does he call it a ministry of death? Because to break the law of God meant death. And guess what? We've all broken the law. Again, verse 7, but if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stone, the Ten Commands, the Old Covenant, came with glory, and it did, so much glory that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face was fading as it was. Verse 8, here's here's a summary. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more glorious? And it is. Look at chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 1, since, uh, therefore, since we have this ministry, Paul's talking about the new covenant. As we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. That means no matter how much we have to suffer as apostles of the new covenant, it doesn't matter. Uh, verse 5, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Christ's sake. For God who said light shall shine in the darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God. How? In the face of Christ. Um, Over the next coming weeks, Lord willing, should he not return, the way things are going in our world, I wouldn't doubt he returns. But should he tarry, we'll have plenty of opportunity to further explain and explore the new covenant. But for now, I want us to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and to focus on what Paul says in our text. Please allow me the privilege, again, of reading verses 12 through 17. Paul says this, again, announcing the transcendent. Verse 12, now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened to me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went to Macedonia. Here it begins. But, thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like, remember the false prophets, we are not not like the many peddling the word of God. But as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Paul begins in verse 12 by mentioning places like Troas, verse 12, Macedonia, verse 13. And essentially he's saying this, that This ministry that God has given me takes me many places, Corinth. You understand that? Many places. Essentially, I go where I find God has opened a door. And even when God has opened a door, I still experience sorrow. I still experience my weakness. I find no rest for my spirit. Why is that? Because as messenger of the new covenant, Paul is going to explain what it's like being him by the use of several very powerful metaphors. The first metaphor, if you're taking note, is a triumph. What in the world is a triumph? I've talked about this over the years, but again, when Paul talks about a triumph, he's referring to a Roman triumph. If you were a citizen in Rome, you may be privileged once in your lifetime to witness a Roman triumph. What was a Roman triumph? A Roman triumph was this amazing procession. We might call it a parade, although that would be really a lack of a concept, in which a notorious, significant general returns back to Rome, to the streets of Rome, 
to the main fair of the Roman capital, victoriously having been victorious in, in conquest over significant battles. That's what Paul has in mind. Included in this triumph would be prisoners of war, victorious soldiers, on carts, parades, uh, floats, as you will, depictions of battle scenes, spoils of war, all kinds of stuff, incense and worshipers, musicians and dancers, and it went on and on and on. And notice verse 14, where Paul says this as he begins this section, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Who is leading this triumph? Paul? No. No. God. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and simply manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Wherever God leads us in this triumph as apostles of the new covenant, everywhere he leads us with our coming comes the aroma of the knowledge of God in Christ. God is the general who leads Paul in Christ, traveling from place to place as God leads, as God opens the door. All along, the servant Paul suffering, realizing again and again his weakness. And yet he goes because everywhere he goes with his message, the knowledge of God in Christ is made known. You get it? Travel plans? You're worried about my travel plans? And here's the paradox in this. Is Paul doesn't see himself as a victorious soldier, but rather sees himself as a captive. Yes, Paul is part of God's triumph, but Paul sees himself as one of God's prisoners of war. He leads us. God leads Paul in his victorious procession. How? Through Paul preaching the gospel, the new covenant, wherever he is led by God in this triumph, Paul spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of God in Christ wherever he goes, and yet he suffers as he does so, realizes again and again his weakness. He stands in contrast to the false apostles in, in Corinth, who he refers to as peddlers in verse 17. As Paul is led as a captive in God's triumph, those who hear him are divided into two groups, those who are being saved and those who are perishing. No other response. Some will be saved, some will perish, depending on how they respond to simply the message that this prisoner, this weak man preaches. It's got nothing to do with me, Paul's saying. It's God's triumph. The message is Christ. All I do is proclaim it. And in proclaiming it, people's eternal fates are sealed. Some to life and some to death. The Corinthians were underwhelmed by Paul. They see him as non-triumphant, but rather debilitated. But it is this Paul's sharing in the humiliation of Christ, that which makes him so powerful. Listen to me, as a preacher of the new covenant which centers on the death of Christ, there is a continuity between the preacher, Paul, and the one preached Christ. Paul shares in his weakness, in his sufferings, the sufferings of Christ before a godless world. The sufferings of the obedient Christ are shared by the obedient and captive apostle. That's what Paul said. The motif of fragrance and aroma, you notice verse 15, we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing, to one an aroma from death to death, to another an aroma from life to life. What is he referring to? This is another motif, and it takes us back to the Old Testament Levitical sacrifices, in which in many places in the Old Testament, those sacrifices, those deaths, those, those offerings, those bloody sacrifices are said to be burnt and become a soothing aroma before God. Sacrifice. The pleasing smell of sacrifice in the nostrils of God. It's over and over and over again. 
And Paul himself is metaphorically saying that I am a new covenant sacrifice before God. I am the aroma, not of myself, but of Christ, verse 15, to God and to those who hear the gospel, some to death and some to life. Again, his sufferings exist as a sacrifice, as, as a scent, a fragrance of offering and sacrifice to God because the world into which Christ came and suffered is the very same world into which Paul preaches that same Christ. And please get this. As he suffers, and as he preaches, he is faced with a great reality. One commentator calls this great reality, listen, he calls it, quote, the horrifying truth. The horrifying truth. What is it? Paul knows that when he preaches Christ crucified and risen, that people's eternal destinies will be determined in those encounters. His message and how people respond to his message will determine the eternity of those who hear. Notice verse 16 carefully, to which Paul says this, who is adequate for these things? Who is adequate for the weight of this reality? Preaching the gospel as if people's eternal souls dependent on it. Why? Because it does. Paul's fear, and frankly my fear, is for us to hear the gospel of the new covenant and to be unaffected by it, to be unchanged by it. For Corinth, the evidence of being unaffected and unchanged by it was their persistent concern with the trivial. Travel plans, really? You wronged me, really? Have you not heard what I've preached to you? Who is adequate for these things? Um, when we share the gospel, not just from this pulpit, with anybody, our kids, do you not know that the message you're declaring to whoever you're declaring it to has eternal consequence? We should all say to ourselves, who is adequate for these things? Who is adequate for these things? Let's pray together. Father, we are humbled to have become by your grace, through your Son and through your Spirit, through your apostles and their word, both spoken and written, to become people of the new covenant, to know Christ and to know you in Christ. Father, we are humbled to know that our sins have been forgiven, to be remembered no more, that your grace is greater than all of our sin. We are thankful, Father, to know who God is. Prior to the new covenant and the coming of Christ, at best, the entire the entirety of humanity had glimpses, shadows, and then Jesus came, God in flesh, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten. <coughs> Father, we are humbled to be recipients of such a great thing, such a great truth, such an eternal truth, such a transcendent truth. May that truth affect us appropriately that we might be set free from our preoccupation with the trivial. That we might allow the trivial to be trivial and allow the transcendent to be transcendent. 
Help us as a church to be faithful ministers of the new covenant. Help us to understand it, to know it, to believe it, to apply it, and then to declare it. We ask for your grace in all of this. <clears throat> for the person here today who does not know Christ, who has never believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ in a saving way, please hear what Paul is saying because I feel the same weight. When you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, depending on how you respond, it can bring about life and life ultimately, life eternal. Or it can bring death, death eternal. Um, please take seriously the claim of God's word, the Bible, the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, Jesus. We're born into this world sinners without hope. God made himself perfectly known in Christ, provided perfect salvation through the cross, gave perfect evidence through the resurrection, sent the spirit that we might perfectly understand him, the gospel, the truth, that you might have assurance and belief. God has left nothing out on his part to save sinners like you and me. If you don't know him, uh, I implore you by the mercies of God to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation. A God didn't play games, wasn't playing games when this all took place. And he won't be playing games when Christ returns. I encourage you to believe upon the Lord Jesus. And for us who are Christians, again, help us to re-embrace and wonder, love, and praise the reality that we share by faith in Jesus. May it affect us in such a way that the trivial remains the trivial and the transcendent is the life-changing, life-altering, transcendent truth. Again, we commit ourselves to your care. May the Spirit of God teach us, help us to meditate on these truths. And we ask these things in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. Join me as we stand together. Before I pronounce this benediction, uh, I, don't, I think most of you probably are not aware of some bad but good news. Huh. The Lord took Peggy Merrith home today, Lord's Day, family around her on the day of resurrection, the Lord's Day. She's at home. No more suffering, and uh, hallelujah. And please pray for that family. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.